grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to At Home Worship bleh, with New Dublin Presbyterian Church. I have a couple of announcements for you this morning before we get started. And they all center around uh, the, the side table here in the back hallway. Uh, first of all, we have the current edition of These Days. It's come in the mail. Uh, and they are sitting on that table waiting for you to pick them up if you would like to. And if you want them dropped off or mailed to you, let me know. I'll be glad to do that. Second, uh, donation envelopes are available in the same place, that side table in the back hallway. Uh, if you would like to give via check or cash, want to use one of these donation envelopes, they are there as well for you to pick up. If you prefer to give uh, in electronic ways through your debit or credit card or through your bank account, you can do that now too. We've set up online giving, which you can do on our website. If you go to newdublin.org and look for the Give uh, tab at the top of the page, you should find uh, instructions and information and the link to give there. Finally, we are delighted to welcome the Woodwards to worship this morning uh, as they read our scripture for us. So thank you, John and Jan. If you're interested in reading scripture one of these weeks, please do let me know. Uh, we'd be glad, glad, glad to set that up with you. Hello, I'm John Woodward. Jan Woodward. And we're here to read Mark 2, the whole thing. Chapter. Okay. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, for he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And there, having dug through it, they let it down. They let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. <coughs> now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? Is it blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once there was perceived in his spirit that they were, that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may excuse me, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority of earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. See, the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, the son of Ephraim, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, collectors they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, 
Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick I have come to call, not the righteous, but the sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But you disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the, the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth or an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and the worst tear is made. And no one can put new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine would burst the skins, and the wine is lost. So there are skins. But he, but one puts new wine into the fresh wine skins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain, grain fields, and as they made their way to his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing this? Is it not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you ever read what David did when he, was, when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Albathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which, is, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some of it to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for, the, was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the, so the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. We've come to the second chapter of Mark. Once again, it was a fairly long reading, and uh, thank you again to John and Jan for doing it. It consists of four stories, and they all hang together thematically. They're all, broadly speaking, on the subject of Jesus's authority. Mark doesn't uh, record the stories of Jesus's life in a strict chronological order. Now you keep, you know, the broad outlines are the same, right? He's baptized at the beginning, uh, he dies and is resurrected at the end, but uh, a lot of times he arranges the stories of Jesus's doings and Jesus's uh, teachings in um, kind of thematic ways. So, if, so if we get these four stories are all broadly about Jesus's authority over the forces of our lives, Jesus' authority to heal. It harks back to the first sentence of the first chapter of Mark, where it says that this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and now he's turning his attention, what does it mean to say that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Because there's lots of things that could mean. It could mean, for instance, that he is a great general, that he's come to rescue his people militarily. It could mean uh, that he's like a, um, like a hall monitor watching to make sure that you behave yourself. It can mean all sorts of things. Uh, but instead of giving us a lecture... Mark tells us these four stories about what Jesus says and does during his time on earth. The first one is a healing story. Uh, the story of how the man was lowered through the roof. You can imagine it now. The crowd dusting the dirt off their shoulders, muttering about the nerve of some people looking down at the man who was lowered through the roof 
on a pallet by his friends. It's not the first time in Mark that crowds actually prevent access from Jesus. This is probably one of the more unique solutions, though, creative solutions. Tear off the roof, lower him down. It would have been a messy process. But Jesus isn't offended by the mess or the straw raining down on his head. He looks down at the man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Well, if the crowd was probably annoyed by the rain of debris, they have to be annoyed now. Because first of all, Jesus, that's not really the point, is it? Didn't the mat tip you off? The paralysis? What the guy needs is to be healed. He needs to be able to walk, provide for himself. But that pales in comparison because second of all, how dare you, Jesus? I'm sure you're a great guy and all, but you know, you're a guy. The only one who can forgive sins is God. That's how the crowd reacted. And to be honest, that's how I can see myself reacting as well. We do like, don't we, to catch people out. To see that they think more of themselves than they should. Some things about human nature haven't changed all that much between now and then. But, you know, Jesus isn't embarrassed. He's not worried about the crowd's disapproval or my disapproval. Maybe the forgiveness of his sins wasn't what the paralyzed man was looking for. Maybe that wasn't his obvious need. But Jesus knows that it's his deepest one. Jesus knows that it's what the man needs from him specifically. Physical healing, maybe he can find somewhere else but spiritual healing only Jesus can bring. But even though he's not embarrassed or worried about the crowd's objections, he does respond to them. He's gracious to them as well. He wants to help them understand what they're seeing. Why are you thinking these things, he says? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take up your mat, and walk. Only one of them, you see, uh, is, is provable physically. But I want you to know, he says, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. There's that word authority again. So he says to the man, I tell you, get up your mat and go home. Notice the order of priority here. Jesus is primarily interested in healing the man's soul. But in order to make it really clear that he does, in fact, have the authority to do that, that he is the guy who can heal your soul, he heals the man's body as well. Healing the soul is the point. Healing his body comes as a kind of visible proof visible healing to support the claim of invisible healing. Jesus has the power to heal the body, but more to the point, he has the authority to heal the soul from the sickness of sin. So Jesus' authority is the authority over both. But the authority over the soul is primary here. The second story then comes uh, to add to the first one. He's, Mark tells the story about Jesus at a dinner party with tax collectors. Just in case from the first story you were inclined to think that Jesus' authority extends only to the people who deserve it, just in case you think that Jesus here is making an exception for a guy who otherwise is pretty great. Mark tells us about the time when Jesus called a tax collector to follow him and then sat down and ate with him and other people too who were just as bad. 
You've probably heard in sermons before about how tax collectors were viewed at the time. But I just want to take a moment to drive it in. Nobody likes paying taxes, especially, especially if you have good reason to think that the guy who's collecting them is fleecing you to line his own pockets with. But it was worse than that. These tax collectors are Jews who are collecting taxes for Rome, for the enemy. It's like being a mole, a traitor. You're cooperating with the people who have invaded and are occupying your land against your own people. It's a whole other level of betrayal and hatred than just, you know, I think that guy is playing fast and loose with my money. These were not good people in the eyes of society. They're not good guys who've made a few mistakes. These are people whose whole life is characterized by doing things that are despicable. And these are the people, Mark tells us, that Jesus chooses to sit down and eat with. He calls one of them to be a disciple. These people, these moles, these traitors, aren't too far gone for Jesus to love. So you see, Mark is saying, Jesus isn't here just to forgive the people who are basically good but mess up every now and then. His authority to heal and to forgive sins is absolute. He's here precisely to reach and heal the people that everybody else thinks is too far gone. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, says Jesus. If you have a cold, you can take cold medicine. It's the sick, the really sick, who need the doctor. Jesus has come to earth with authority to forgive sins, and that's exactly what he means to do. He's here to be our doctor. So he's not going to laugh at us or reject us for needing him. So we come to the third story. Jesus, we have heard, is the kind of Messiah with the authority to forgive sins, and he's shown up to do exactly that. He's not looking for righteous people. He's looking for the sinners so that he can heal them. But what should sinners do to attract his attention? What should they do once they've been found? They should mope around and Look, sorry, there's snow falling off the building. It's distracting. <laughs> there's, they should mope around and look sad and sorry. They should look penitent. Maybe they should shave off all their hair and, and um, wear hair shirts, things that are uncomfortable. Well, there's a time and a place for repentance, of course, and even for fasting, as Jesus makes clear. But it isn't all the time. There was a fad in Jesus' day uh, for really holy people to do a lot of fasting. The few, the proud, God's Marine Corps, they fasted a lot, far more than any requirement in the law was to fast. Because it seemed like a good way to prove to God how sorry they were for their sins, how sorry they were for their country's sin. Uh, maybe to bring an end to this kind of exile. They're at home, but not under their own authority. So you could tell a serious religious person by their fasting habits. And so when Jesus and his disciples aren't fasting all the time, people notice. And not just religious leaders, right? Notice in this story, uh, it's not the scribes or the Pharisees that object. It's just the normal people. They come up and they say, Jesus, you and your disciples aren't fasting. And you know, if you want to be taken seriously as a religious leader, maybe you should get on that. And Jesus doesn't reject fasting as a bad thing. In fact, he acknowledges that in the future there will be reasons for his disciples to fast. But right now, with Jesus fasting, being sorrowful and sad, that's about as appropriate as wearing funeral clothes to a wedding. 
Jesus' mere presence brings joy. The old religious paradigms aren't going to work. Jesus and his disciples aren't subject to the old ways. His authority, actually his actual person, establishes a new way. New joyful wine for new joyful wineskins. Jesus doesn't need the people that he's rescuing from their sin to be obsessed with their sin. He's here. They have something more important to focus on than their own failings. So we learn that living with Jesus and accepting his authority in our lives isn't going to make us gloomy. We're not going to turn into that American Gothic painting, you know, with the the couple and the pitchforks and they're looking very, very solemn. He's come to heal us of our flaws and failings and the evil that lurks in our hearts. He's going to restore us as servants and children of God, no matter how far from home we've wandered. And he's going to do it joyfully. And he's going to make us joyful too. He's going to laugh and celebrate with us. Forget clouds and harps. Is it any wonder that in some ways the central image of heaven in the Bible, this table right here, is a feasting table. It's a dinner party table. It's not a funeral. It's not a courthouse. It's a feast. And finally, Mark strings one more bead onto this necklace. He's told us that Jesus has divine authority, authority to forgive sins, authority to heal broken souls and the will to do it, authority that is glad and joyful and not at all gloomy. And now he thinks that you might have one more question. Has God always been like this? Has the kingdom of God always been like this? Or has God changed his mind in Jesus, turned from being a gloomy and resentful and angry God into a loving and joyful and forgiving God? We've all heard that before, that there's a difference between the way God acts in the Old Testament and the way he acts in the New Testament. But it's not true. And to prove it, Mark remembers another thing Jesus did. This time, a teaching centered around the most defining feature in the life of God's people, which was keeping the Sabbath. You can read old accounts of ancient people encountering Jewish uh, people and just being astonished from sundown Friday to to sundown Saturday. There is no work. And, of course, the line between work and not work is a little blurry sometimes, so there's a whole host of other rules that go into effect to try to make the difference clear. How many steps can you take before going on a journey? How much can you carry before you're bearing a burden? The opportunity for this teaching comes as Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field of wheat, And the disciples reach out and pick some and eat it. This is allowed in general. Uh, They're not stealing. Uh, Travelers are allowed to satisfy their hunger that way by gleaning. Uh, The issue was, though, that they're gleaning on the Sabbath. Gleaning is work. They're violating God's law by working, not by stealing. So the Pharisees this time... Offer a challenge. Jesus, your followers are breaking God's law. They're working on the Sabbath. What are you going to do about it? Well, by this fourth story, we figured out that you can't embarrass or shame Jesus. And instead of being defensive of himself or his disciples, he reaches back into the Old Testament and brings out a time when David was on the run from King Saul. And even David, the greatest king Israel ever had, one of the great heroes of faith, broke the rules 
when it came down to necessity. He ate food that only priests sought to eat, and he gave some to his followers, and they did as well. And he was not a priest, and they weren't either. They broke, technically, one of God's laws. And the point that Jesus makes with this story is that the Sabbath, this huge important law of God that takes so much time and planning and effort, was not put into place for God's sake. It wasn't established because God needed his people to take the Sabbath, but because human beings need the Sabbath, because we need the rest. We need the remembrance that the whole world does not rely on us and our busyness. The Sabbath was always intended to be a merciful rule for the people who kept it. And so it shouldn't be used as an excuse to keep people from getting what they need, even if technically that means working on the Sabbath. God's authority, Jesus' authority, had from the very beginning, from the time of the Ten Commandments until now, been characterized by mercy and gentleness and concern for us. You don't ask your children not to touch the stove because you need the stove not to be touched, right? It's because if they do, they're going to get hurt. It's for their good, not for yours. So when we take a step back and look at the whole chapter, all four stories, we hear Mark telling us that Jesus is Lord with authority not only over the physical world but over the spiritual world as well. That he uses that authority for the healing and redemption of people who have gone far astray from God and God's plan for our lives that living the new life with Jesus is not gloomy, that calling God Lord and accepting his authority over our life is not a stressful, strict kind of thing like a house that's got security cameras all over being watched by a prison guard. It's much more like running to your parent when you've fallen or burned yourself and having them pick you up. None of your wounds are going to make him drop you. None of them are beyond his ability to heal. And finally, that the rules he gives you to live by aren't there just because he likes rules or wants to control you, but are there in order for you to live a safe and ha healthy and happy life now and to eternity. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Up until now, we have been, ever since really we started at home worship, uh, I've been giving you a guided uh, prayer thing at, after after the sermon in the bulletin uh, for you to pray at home. And I did that because I wanted to encourage you to take up the mantle yourself of praying for our country and our world and our church. Um, and because praying is not something we watch. Um, and it's, it's odd, you know, to pray alone in the sanctuary a couple days before you all see this. But I've heard from many of you that you miss uh, our time of praying together, even if we are separated by time and by space. And I've heard that. And so while I encourage you to continue your own practice of praying for our country and our church and our world, uh, let's go back to praying together here and now as well. So join me, please, in the prayers of the people. Gracious and merciful Father, we thank you that you want us to pray, that you are eager to hear our needs and our concerns from us, even though you know them already. And we thank you that we can pray in confidence 
that you hear us in love. Lord, we pray for the world that you have made that is suffering in many times, in many ways, through the coronavirus primarily. We pray for the sick and the dying, for the grieving. We pray for those who take care of them. We pray for those who are developing vaccines, for those who are distributing vaccines. We pray for your healing in whatever form it will take. And we pray for those places that suffer under war or the rumor of war, that you would bring a just and honorable peace. For those that suffer oppression, that you would bring freedom and dignity. For those who suffer from natural disaster, that you would comfort their grief and help them rebuild. Lord, we pray for our nation, for our leaders on all levels from the county to the nation, that they might serve you in what they do, that they might keep the good of their people as their first priority over any desire for personal gain or glory. We pray that you would bring unity and healing to a nation that is so deeply divided. We ask that the truth, which is always your truth, would prevail. And Lord, we pray for those dearest to us, especially for Ramanta as she heals in the hospital, and for those whom we name before you now in silence. work in their lives wonders beyond all we could ask or imagine. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.